Uh, let's see. Okay, Jacqueline's at work. She's doing good. Okay, good. Um, so, yes, I mean, if you got to work or whatever, don't get in trouble with your boss or anything like that. You always have a recording. If I have more than, you know, one or two people on here, I always have a recording and upload it within, you know, an hour or so after um, we get done here. Um, next Wednesday, we'll probably have one about the same time. Again, I haven't really heard from too many other people about what a good time would be on Wednesday to do these. So I'm just assuming 4.30 to 5.30 would work uh, for everybody. Um, but I, obviously I know the 4.30 and 5.30 doesn't work for everybody because not 24 or 25 of y'all are here. So um, I'm hoping you're able to get into the week, weekly folders to review these at some point. Um, being that Labor Day is Monday, I might not be able to do the pre-recorded Monday one just because there's nobody going to be here on Monday. So the only video type deal might be Wednesday. Um, but I may, you know, split that one up a couple sections, do a live one and do something pre-recorded, depending on how time is. Uh, because the next week's reading, we're reading the uh, Marvel piece, and it's about 25 to 30 pages in length. So um, once the week three folder opens up later this week, I would probably strongly suggest you start reading a little bit each day uh, just because I believe you do have a quiz next week over the reading. And to try to go through 25 or 30 pages in a day and then try to do the quiz isn't going to be too pleasant on your part, I don't think, unless you're just a really good reader and can remember everything. Um, the other thing is, and we're going to look at, if not later today, definitely next week, I did send out a sample fiction exam. I emailed it and I uploaded one to your week two folder yesterday. So that's sort of a study guide, so to say. It's an exam that I've used before in the past. It won't be the same exam, obviously. It's going to be different questions, that type deal. But it gives you sort of the structure and the field of how the exam is going to be. Um, you will have two hours to complete it once you get started with it. So keep that in mind. Once you hit start to begin, you have to stay there and finish it. Um, I also know that being that's an online course, how am I going to know you're not cheating, right? Using a book, using notes. Well, the deal with that is um, when it comes final exam, you're not going to be able to do that because you're going to have to do the proctor you. So if by some way you get through exam one and exam two doing that, hey, that's that's fine. That's on you, I guess. But just keep in mind, a lot of the stuff that we are reading are coming from the folders. They're not 100% in that textbook. So if you're having to surf the net or shift through a lot of the folders and the books, because the folders are going to be basically closed down week from week. So if you don't get the stuff from week one or week two, then you're not going to be able to get the stuff for it because they're going to disappear on you. But if you have time to go through all of that and you looked at the exam to see how it is, it's going to be hard to basically do that um, because you're going to spend a good hour or more just trying to surf the internet looking for stuff. And before you know it, the two hour mark's going to run out. And once it runs out, whatever you turn in is what I'm going to grade. So if you don't turn anything in or you don't answer anything, then obviously it's going to be a zero. I can't reopen it um, because you're going to have, you know, during that week, week five, you're going to have from Sunday to Wednesday to do the test. And then from Wednesday to that Sunday to finish up the fiction exam. Because that's pretty much all we're doing week five. We're doing the exam first half, and then you're turning the paper in the second half, which everybody should be, by the time we start next week, thinking about what topic they want to choose to write their four to five page paper on. And I think during my last video, we talked about how to go about quoting short stories. So if you haven't looked at that, you... I would strongly suggest that you look at it tonight before it shuts down and disappears. Otherwise, you're going to have to go to, you know, like YouTube and that type of stuff to figure out how to quote short stories using MLA format. Um, really, the format you should have learned from 1101. Uh, last time you took English 1101, because the prose writing, how to uh, quote a research paper, that type deal, 
is pretty much similar. Where it's going to be different is when we talk about poetry and drama, October and November. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as it gets closer. So at this point, is there any questions about what I just talked about up, up to this point? Or are we good? Okay, I'm going to assume that we were good. And if you have any questions, please email me uh, when, they, when they pop up. So let's talk about The Open Boat, right? It was written in 1897. It's by Stephen Crane. Uh, his particular years were uh, 1871 through 1900. You might have read The Red ba Badge of Courage or seen a movie of it, maybe in high school at some point. That happened during 1895 about a young man's experience of civil war. Uh, a lot of times you read that in 11th and 12th grade, depending on where you go uh, to high school. He was from the old American family since the 1600s, son of a, a Methodist minister. His early novel, which is really more or less like a short novel, is Maggie, A Girl of the Streets in 1893, set in the Psalms in New York. He also wrote other short stories and poetry. So I don't know how much interaction you've had up until this class with anything written by Crane, but he deals mainly in the naturalism element of literature and the realism of literature, as you will tell from uh, the particular short story of ours, The Open Boat. Uh, like Hemingway, he sort of became like a war uh, correspondent uh, as he joined in 1897 with the Cuban uh, insurrection after he uh, published and wrote The Red Badge of courage. Here's sort of a picture of Crane. You can probably find more of those, of course, if you Google image. A uh, little bit more history about Crane and particularly the open boat. Uh, this is really his take of a real life accident that happened on his boat. Uh, it happened in January 1897. Again, if you read the pat or read the story, you learn about some of the stuff about the water being cold in January. Well, it's because it was. It's real life here. Um, basically, his uh, boat in this case was the SS Commodore. It sank off Florida. Basically, it was between uh, Jacksonville and St. Augustine. Uh, so if you've ever been, obviously, we know where Jacksonville is at. You've probably been there a few times. St. Augustine's a little further south. A really good historical uh, place in Florida. Um, he published his account first in a newspaper, and then he turned what he was doing in the newspaper into this short story, The Open Boat. He eventually settled in 1897 in England with Cora Howard, who had been Madam of a Brothel in Florida, uh, became friend of another short story novelist, Henry James. I don't know how much Henry James, you have uh, read in the past. Uh, in the 1900s, he did die in Germany of tuberculosis, or TB, as we know it here, more of a modern uh, time. Uh, some of us still have to get tuberculosis shots. Uh, you've probably heard about tuberculosis throughout history. A lot of major writers during the 18th, 1900s died from it um, because it was very rampant. Here's sort of the picture of Florida. Again, it sort of happened in between Jacksonville and Savannah here. Um, most of us have been to Jacksonville, St. Augustine, throughout you know, Florida. As you can tell, big Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico on the west. Um, so that's where the, the actual Commodore sort of went down. And I don't know if this is really a, an actual picture of it, but you can kind of see um, how it would look. A lot of times when you think about boats and that type of stuff, if you ever go to Macintosh or Dairy and you see the shrimp boats. Um, so it looks at about that same length here. He also talks about the Mosquito Inlet Lighthouse and the dinghy. So again, if you've ever been to St. Simons or Jekyll, you've probably seen a lighthouse at some point. Um, you've probably seen a dinghy. 
If you watch videos, you might have actually, you might have one or been on one. One of his biggest themes throughout this piece and a lot of his works overall is this theme of nature or naturalism versus civilization. Um, so if you read anything from Jack London, like his novel, To Build a Fire, uh, you would see like the indifference of nature and the necessity for each person to confront that indifference independently. So we notice there's like four major characters on this particular boat or in this story. They each one have their own sort of opinion about how to go about solving the problem that they're now faced in, right? They're trying to get the shore. They're trying to keep hope alive. They're trying to stay alive. Um, we also know we have this feeling about the ability of people to work together to make meaning, be civilized, right? So you have four different characters. They may not necessarily agree or like each other, but somehow they sort of have this mutual respect that say, hey, we're all in this together. We need to figure out something that's going to help us get the shore. Otherwise, we're going to perish out here in this cold, you know, shark infested waters of St. Augustine. And we're not going to be able to live to tell our tale. And we know by the end, one of them does die. It's the younger one. It's Billy, right? He succumbs to whatever is going on at that time with him. But in some ways, he wasn't really all a part of the group, right? He, he was always one of the ones that was always questioning things and always questioning things to a larger degree like he didn't have the ability to trust other folks. Well, I mean, any time in life when you're up, you know, faced up to a predicament where you need to go in a group effort, you have to trust the members of that group to help you get through. Otherwise, you might as well have four people fighting each other and four people trying to fight to get to shore, which nobody's never going to make it to shore if, you, if you're always fighting with each other. If we look at the opening paragraph, and again, I don't, I'm not sure how many have their actual copy of the Twain or the Crane piece, but I'm going to look at a couple um, sentences here. And it really deals with, and I'm not going to necessarily read all of these because I know you can kind of read and look here at this point. It deals with the uh, perception, right? None of them knew the color of the sky. Their eyes glanced level and were fastened upon the waves that swept toward them. In the wane light, right, the faces of the men must have been gray. Their eyes must have glinted in strange ways as they glazed steadily astern. Viewed from a balcony, the whole thing would doubtlessly have been weirdly picturesque. But the men in the boat had no time to see it. So when you think about this perception that our narrator is getting, because again, going back to are we doing first person? Are we second person? Are we third person limited? And in this case, I would say we're pretty much third person limited um, because Crane, in a lot of ways, is the narrator. Obviously, he's the writer. He has some experience. This really happened to him in real life. But when we think about this opening paragraph and we have this perspective, we have to think to ourselves, what kind of sight are they looking at at this point? Because we have this description of color. Uh, we know how waves are. If you've ever been on the beach or you've been on a boat, you know how things can go really well one minute and can go really south next. But the whole deal that these faces of men have been gray, right? Why would they be gray? Are they gray because of real, you know, reflection from the sky? Well, we don't really know that, right? Are they gray because of the horror? that they're about to find themselves in, basically capsized. Um, they didn't really have time to react. They didn't have time to see it. It was sort of that quick, right? It passed them by, sort of like life. If you don't open your eyes, sometimes you're 18 one day and now you're 45 the next. It's that quick for them, right? Um, if you look at some of the language figurative language. And again, if you looked at that handout I passed or I uploaded last week, they talk a little bit about similes and metaphors. And I give you some page numbers here that will sort of correspond, I hope, with uh, the work that you have. 
But if you look, a lot of these sentences deal with metaphors, right? This particular quotation, many a man ought to have a bathtub larger than the boat, which here rode upon the sea. Well, how is that a metaphor? What, what's so metaphorical about that? Well, a bathtub larger than the boat, right? So the metaphor there is what they're in is not really larger than a bathtub. So you kind of get a picture of how big this boat really is. And you got four people. It's hard to sit comfortably in a bathtub, right? If, especially if you got kids. How many kids can you really get in a bathtub? One, maybe two. Uh, depending on how large or how big your kids are. Uh, but grown men, and we're talking about grown men at this case, not too many grown men can fit one to a bathtub, let alone two or three. Uh, so that's sort of the ship or that's sort of the boat that they're in, right? In St. Augustine, in these waters. If we look, we know we have a cook, right? He's one of the characters. Uh, if we look at this particular quote, quote, wouldn't have a show without a onshore wind, right? They now rode this wild colt of a dinghy like circus men. So again, wild coat, colt, horse, that type deal. Dinghy's the boat, obviously. Circus men, you know, you think about the people that train the elephants and that type of stuff. Um, so the cook is really representing a little bit of comical relief here. Uh, he's trying to make, you know, more sense out of the situation, maybe in more of a, a funny or ironic way, uh, because they just sort of look goofy in this bathtub larger than a boat type deal, trying to get the shore. Um, and again, here, this is more, more or less a good example of simile, because, you know, going back for your definition, a simile uses like and as. So like, right? Um if we look here, cook with arm around Euler's shoulders. And again, Euler is the character Billy, who ultimately does die uh, trying to get the sh shore. Uh, they were the babies of the sea, which is really interesting metaphor too, right? So how can you be babies of the sea? Well, you don't really know what you're doing if you're lost at sea or if you don't know how to get the boat or the equipment to work for you it works against you. You're sort of the baby at the sea. The sea in itself is the parent, right? It's controlling every sort of action that's going to be happening to you, especially if you don't know how to swim, um, which most of these characters did know how to swim. But if you think, if you're out in the middle of Atlantic Ocean and you guys swim for a long period of time, you're going to get tired, especially if you come up across some sharks, which they do. Or if you come up across a storm or a tempest, um, or if they come up at that time, you know, it was during the deal with war with Cuba and that type of stuff going on. Uh, if you came up with, you know, face to face with a enemy boat, what do you do now? Because you're basically in this little boat with no weapons. And. What are you going to do if the enemy comes up and gets you, right? You, you're not going to have much of a choice. Bucketing uh, Bronco sort of relates going back to the cowboy, the cult there. Um, it's just sort of a metaphor or imagery there that you can kind of take. Babies in the woods, right, is another me metaphor. Um, think of being lost in the woods, being like babies in the woods. Uh, or, you know, even grown adults get lost in the woods if they don't know where they're going. You're sort of setting ducks to whatever is out in the woods, whether that be bears or if you're over in Africa or something, elephants or giraffes or that type of stuff. So when we look at the characters, we have the cook who's sort of heavy set or fat. He's the talker. He's cheerful. He gives a lot of irrelevant talk. I think he just sort of keeps things lighthearted and comical. Um, I mean, if you think of most cooks that you probably see in movies and TV shows and other books and, um, you know, maybe day to day people here, they sort of have that same attitude as the cook here in the store. Um, they're always usually cheerful. They're always usually talkative. 
Um, sometimes when they talk to you, it's about stuff that doesn't really have any relation to anything. They just want to talk and make people happy. Uh, Euler, he's a little bit more physical. He's agile. He's the worker. He's quiet. Uh, he usually gives more of the, you know, rows more than most of the characters in the boat. Um, but at the same time, I think he tires himself out because he is so out agile and strong and he wants to try to make the best of the situation. Um, as you can tell from these two particular quotations, right? He likes to focus on work. Um, he basically wants, like I said, he wants to sort of control a good bit of what's going on. Um, and, and sometimes that could be, you know, your downside. If you're too prideful, um, it can hurt more than it can, you know, help. Um, if we look at some of the other characters, we have the captain, right? It says here, the mine rooted deep in the timbers of a sunken ship. Um, he has seven faces, the seven men who died, right? Impression of the scene. So they already lost some folks up to the point where there were only four in that particular boat. So the captain obviously has a heavy burden on his sh short shoulders, so to speak. He's like the pilot, like, you know, airplane crash or something, and the pilot survives. You know, the pilot would have that burden, just like the captain here would have the burden of in losing anybody on a ship. Usually the captain's the last one to go, right? He's usually a good captain will stick with the ship with his um, people on board. Um, the correspondent. You can kind of think the correspondent means has a relation with Crane because Crane was sort of the correspondent during that time when it comes to wartime. He was the one wanting to be the writer and that type deal. Um, he's usually the main center of consciousness as you sort of read through the 15 pages. He is cursing and sarcastic. Um, so he is probably more, more or less... Um, closer to Crane, the author, than any of the other three characters uh, because they share a lot in common. Obviously, they share the name Correspondent because that's what uh, Crane eventually became when he started writing about the Cuban situation and when he started writing uh, his stories for newspapers. If we look at sort of the conversation they have between um, – the cook and the correspondent, we get to see a lot of this stuff come out about the sarcasm, about the cursing, that type deal at the end of section one of the particular story. And this particular conversation is between the cook and uh, correspondent, or you can kind of say cook and crane um, if you wanted really to, to be a little bit more technical with it. Where it says houses of refuge don't have crews, right? We're thinking about them trying to find now they're in the water they're trying to get to shore they're trying to find help said the correspondent as i understand them they are only places where clothes and grub are stored for the benefit of ship shipwrecked people they don't carry crews and of course here the cook sort of picks up and chimes in oh yes they do no they don't well we're not there yet anyhow said the oiler. So we have the oiler also sort of in between these two sort of bickering. Um, the cook thinks there's going to be help on shore with these particular houses of refuge. We have the correspondent basically saying, no, they just store stuff. There's nobody going to be really there to help us or get anything for us. And then we have the young oiler basically said, well, both of y'all shut up. We're not even there yet. You're thinking way too ahead. You might be thinking about the worst when you really need to be thinking about, let's try to get to shore. Let's get there and see what's there. So they're a little bit bickering. Uh, and that would happen pretty much in any stressful situation when you have four grown men of various ages, various heights, abilities, that type deal, skill sets, it's the middle of the night, and you're trying to survive, right? Because back in the 1800s, you didn't have the cell phone, so you couldn't just sit there and call somebody and reach out and touch someone. Um, they didn't really have a lot of, you know, helicopters and airplanes to come in and fly and scoop them out. So in a lot of ways, it was them 
against the waves. It was them against nature. It was again them against the world. So again, that whole deal with the theme nature versus civilization or nature versus man comes into play here because they have to trust each other if they're going to be able to conquer that aspect of nature. Otherwise, all four of them would die, right? Because they don't have anything else to use. The boat's gone. They don't have too many other people out there that's driving by and they don't have any other uh, devices besides the oars and besides their own arms and legs to get across. Uh, some of the language, right, is sparse and detached. Uh, a lot of it is sort of, they say sort of the same thing over and over again. Uh, for some folks, that could be kind of problematic because it's like, you know, you writing an essay and you're saying the words and or for or the a thousand times. It gets sort of old after a while. Uh, but you kind of think, you know, this is Crane sort of being real to the situation. It's probably a real life dialogue or similar to real life dialogue that would that really happened around him at the time that he went sort of shipwrecked at sea. Uh, as you can tell, they rode and they rode, right? It just sounds tiring. If you ever rode a canoe or something of that aspect, um, if you don't have the arm strength or the muscles to do that for a long period of time, uh, you will quit, right? And if you quit from the row, chances are you're not going to be moving too fast. And if the wind or the waves or the tide, that is, is going in two different directions, then you can easily get pulled back out the sea. And then all that work that you try to do rolling would be all for naught, right? You'd be further away from the shore. And then you would also feel like helpless, right? I did all that work for two hours just to get two or three miles in. And all of a sudden my arms give out because I'm tired. And we see that they sort of take the turns, right? They're taking the turns sleeping. They're taking the turns uh, rowing with the oars and you have to because not one person not even an oiler could row you know for hours on straight and we also learn prior to them going shipwreck that a lot of them were too excited to get any rest the days or so earlier that a lot of them didn't eat and a lot of them didn't sleep so they're already coming into this shipwreck situation being exhausted and being hungry so you're already sleep deprived at that point. And anybody that's been up all night for a long period of time realizes you start to hallucinate and see things. And it's not a fun thing to do, especially if you're trying to push forth and trying to go to work. Think about being up all night one day and then having to go to work the next day without any sleep, without any full food for the next eight or 10 hours. Doesn't feel good. You definitely don't are not at your best, and a lot of mistakes can happen. So the good thing about them, they have each other to sort of rely on uh, to sort of get them through. A lot of times when we go to work, it's just us. So if we're sleep deprived and we fall asleep, we're, you know, for the most part, dropping the ball for our boss. You know, especially if you have to do something where you're looking out for other patients or, you know, you're doing stuff with equipment or stuff like that. You can't really afford to go to sleep on the job and there's an accident at the job. Well, it's going to come back on you. Um, there was a there was a sudden tightening of muscles, right? There was some thinking. So, again, this is all physical uh, toward the end here, right? It's physicality to make the best of the situation to get back to shore to save lives. Um, a conference was held in the boat. So you think about a meeting, right? And again, going back to that metaphor of being a, as a bathtub sized boat, uh, how well can you hold a good conference in a bathroom size or a bathtub sized boat? Pretty difficult, really cramped, especially on the ocean. They didn't probably have the best hygiene in the world. They couldn't necessarily have head and shoulders and shampoo the hair or, you know, soap to wash with. So you can only imagine 
if you ever been out around the marsh or the beach, you smell the sea salt and all that stuff. But over time, when you haven't bathed for a long period of time, it's going to catch up with you. So now you have four people on this particular uh, boat that probably don't have the greatest hygiene in the world. Um, so that conference with four people that don't smell the greatest probably isn't all that great. But you do what you got to do to survive, right? Um, the boat and the shore, the interpretation here, right? We look at, you know, if you look at particular pages 732 to 34, we have this unbridgeable divide between man and shore. So again, it's going back from man to nature. This whole theme or mo motif of man versus nature, man versus civilization. Um, men in the boat misinterpret the shore. People on shore misinterpret the men. Because we have that uh, great picture of them finding a shirt. And there's this uh, stick or this particular piece of wood that's floating outside their boat. So they sort of make a makeshift white flag. And one of them picks it up and starts waving it to somebody they see on shore, who I think also picks up a stick and has it like a black shirt. So there's this, you know, this difference of opinion of, you know, are these folks on the shore really understanding what we're trying to convey with the white flag and vice versa? Um, so there's that misinterpretation of the folks on the boat thinking that when they see some of these guys leave the shore or run somewhere else, oh, they're finally going to get help for us. Um, but some don't, right? They sort of go off and it's, again, they miscommunicate with what each other's trying to say from across a distance. One's on shore, one's in the boat. Um, and we get a little bit of that here, right? Well, I wish I could make something out of those signals. What do you suppose he means? So again, these are the people on the boat talking about the people on land. There's that misconnect between those two types of signals. He don't mean anything. He's just playing. So again, if you're in that situation of being scared of your life, right? you're trying to get back on shore. You're trying to get anybody's attention that you can especially if you see somebody on the beach. Um, but they're thinking that these guys on the beach or on the shore are just playing around with them, right? They're sort of mimicking with them with the flag, sort of, you know, the shirt and the stick type deal. Uh, they don't necessarily realize maybe at the time how dire the situation is for the guys on the boat. Um, and that could be a scary situation, especially if you've ever been in that situation where, you're really in danger and the people that, you know, you thought were coming for your aid didn't see how much of a danger you really were in until you were able to get there and tell them a little bit. Because sometimes, you know, folks just think we're playing around if we're in danger when we're really not. Uh, it's sort of like the whole deal about the boy crying wolf. Uh, you want to be careful about saying that too many times, right? Even though it's a short of a short story, uh, at some point, when you cry wolf too many times, people are not going to take you seriously. So in this case, we sort of have that cry wolf moment. We have the ones that are really in the boat that need help, but the people on shore are not really understanding what that help is or what they need to do to, you know, utilize or apply that help. And again, we get sort of this like refrain, like there's this course throughout this particular story. In some ways, I think if you can sort of uh, condense it down, you could probably make sort of a old country song with it. Because it says here, uh, men's repeated reflection. If I'm going to be drowned, if I'm going to be drowned, if I'm going to be drowned, why? In the name of the seven mad gods who rule the sea, was I allowed to come thus far and contemplate sands and trees? Right. He says that sort of question or that refrain or that lyric a few times throughout, you know, the story. Was I brought here merely to have my nose dragged away as, as I was about to nimble the secret cheese of life? So, again, it's sort of this questioning, right? It's man questioning nature. It's man questioning religion. It's man questioning a higher power. It's man questioning God. It's man question. It's always man questioning something bigger and sometimes bat better than he is um, because he doesn't necessarily like his slot 
or lot in life as being out here in the middle of the ocean and possibly, hey, I came this far with my life. I've been through so many experiences and this is how my life is going to end on the boat with three of these other guys. There's got to be more than this. So he's questioning. And, and a lot of times we get to that point in life where we question. Right. I've lived 30 years of my life. And I have this dead end job. There's got to be more than this dead end job. So what do you do? Well, you usually answer that question by possibly going back to college, getting a degree. You may answer that question by trying to apply for a better job. But, you know, at this point in, in the game that you need to have a degree to get a better job. That high school, that GED is just not going to cut it anymore. Um, so a lot of this stuff where you know, Euler or where the correspondent or where the cook or the captain is questioning, we make the same questions. It may not be against, you know, nature as it relates to being in a boat, but we could be stalled in our particular predicament of life at this point. Um, it could be, you know, you're the mother or the father that, you know, sacrificed having a family, getting some of those dead end jobs just to be able to get your kid through college. And now that you're 40 or 50 years old, looking at an empty nest, want to know, well, now what do I do with my life? I don't really have any grandkids at this point. So then now you're questioning nature. Should I go back to school? Should I try to do something different? Should I try to do something new? So we all have that sort of questioning civilization, questioning nature as we mature, as we get older. We follow some of these same patterns as these guys on this boat. Um, then we get to this men and nature. Now I know this Sylvia, uh, Juliet, a white heron, you, you might've read that short story. We're not really reading it here, but in, in, in a sense, this is really, if you want to look at another story, it sort of questions man and nature. You want to probably look back at this, uh, at some point, maybe to be able to understand a little bit more nature and man's aspect throughout other pieces of fiction. Uh, nature does not regard him as important, but waves are important. So we have that little aspect of going on. Uh, nature lacks visible expression or personification to uh, communicate with. Goal is an ugly brute as if made with a jackknife. So again, you got that going on. Shark is a thing. Uh, so we have different metaphors, different, you know, similes, different uh, themes going on here. But it all sort of comes back to man's place among nature. And nature in this case is the open waters, right? It's the things that you would find in open waters, fish, shark, jellyfish, that type of stuff. Um, if we move further, right? We see um, various different other description, right? Now, going back to the correspondent, which, again, you can kind of say is Crane or the narrator in this case, has his own visual expression of nature in the wind tower. So if you remember toward the end, there's this wind tower that, that they uh, realize and see from a distance. Uh, this tower was a giant standing with its back to the plight of the ants. It represented in a degree to the correspondent. Uh, the serenity of nature amid the struggles of the individual. Nature in the wind and nature in the vision of men. She did not seem cruel to him, nor benefit, nor treacherous, nor wise, but she was indifferent, flatly indifferent. So again, they sort of uh, crane here personifies nature as being a she. And a lot of times you might see nature, especially when we get into October, when we talk about poetry, nature will be sometimes capitalized with an N. Um, and sometimes it's always referred to as being a she as well. So just sort of keep that in mind. We know about the brotherhood, the several brotherhood that they have. Right. Four individuals coming from different backgrounds sort of come together to figure out their problems. The men formed a community despite nature's indifference. Right. 
Um, it would be difficult to describe the several brotherhood of men that were here, established on the sea. So it, it was out of this shipwreck that these four individuals, somehow fate, somehow you could say nature, you can say a higher power, brought them together because somehow they lived where everybody else didn't. Brought them together to make the best out of the situation. Is it a crappy situation? Yes. Because they really wore a shipwreck. They could have really possibly, Crane could have possibly died during the shit, shipwreck and would never have had this story, or at least his account on it. Uh, somebody else might have wrote this story, but it wouldn't be Crane. No one mentioned it, but it dwelt in the boat. Each man felt it warmed him. Right? So now you have this, uh, this brotherhood. Right. If you can't count on your brothers, who can you count on? In this case, they had to count on each other to make the best of both worlds, to make the best of the situation, the nature, um, the game that was at hand. They were dealt with some very bad cards for anybody that's played cards before. You know about, you know, if you got bad cards, you're not going to win. Right. Especially with poker or something of that nature. Nature in this case gave them some bad poker hands. They had to use each other to sort of figure out how to make these hands better. Uh, it's like they were given lemonade to be able to do that. And we also have to deal with the oiler, right? Swimming rapidly ahead in the race, characteristic strengths. Uh, the cook swims on the back, characterize the size, coat, Captain holds onto boat, characteristic of the control of the boat. You got this return to land, correspondent, right? The shore was set before him like a bit of scenery on a stage, and he looked at it and understood with his eyes each detail of it, right? And at the end, we have to sort of ask these questions especially as you start thinking about maybe um, the discussion question that's due later this week, or if you plan on writing about this on your first essay, why does a oiler not survive? Is it chance? Uh, too weak from his self-sacrifice, lack of perception or imagination. Divide between sea and land is bridged. Land offers all the remedies sacred to their minds. Men hear the great sea's voice. And they felt that they could then be interpreters. So the, the three that do survive really relate to this. And maybe they were the only ones out of the pack that nature said, hey, we've already sort of determined who's going to survive here. It's a destiny fate type deal. Euler seems to be too proud in his slot in life to really be able to understand the great sea's voice and to be great interpreters because he wanted to sort of do things in a lot of ways on his own. He didn't necessarily want to join the group as much or he always questioned or always griped or always wondered. He didn't sort of see things through and he didn't want to ask for other people's help to see things through. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and end there. Like I said, uh, make sure if you haven't chose a fiction essay topic yet that you do so. I definitely, being that next week is week three, it's due in two more weeks now. You really need to go ahead and start drafting. I would say once you have a topic uh, chose, uh, going by you know this week's week two, next week's week three. If you if your whole goal is to write a four to five page paper. You can start, let's say, on Sunday, write page one, Monday, page two, Tuesday, page three, Thursday, page four. And if you wanted to go page five, you can take next Thursday to do that. Uh, basically, by this time next week, what I would suggest is that you have a good bit of a rough draft written. Now, granted, some of the topics on there we haven't read yet as it relates to stories, but if you can read ahead. Right. You can go through the syllabus and find where those stories are at. Or you can go to Google and type in the stories, free text or free PDF to find those 
ahead of time. You don't have to wait a week four uh, to read the yellow wallpaper or the twain pieces. Um, the similar thing is by the 20th of September, you want to have completed that sample S or that sample fiction exam. Uh, because again, all the stories that are on that fiction exam, we will have read by Sunday, September 20th. Those will be the same stories, different questions, different characters, different concepts, of course, but similar in development and structure that your exam one will look like. Um, so we may go over a little bit of that as it gets closer to the 20th. But for the most part on the uh, week five, I probably probably not going to do a whole lot of videos because I just want you to concentrate on doing well and finishing exam one by the 23rd and doing well and finishing the um, essay one by the 27th so we can move into week six week seven week eight so on and so forth with poetry because we have another four or five weeks with poetry and then we basically finish our semester out with the research paper final exam and drawing uh, so we will have another poetry exam and a poetry uh, essay uh, toward the end of october beginning of november just to sort of give you you know, indication of where we're going after September. Otherwise, if you have any questions, please let me know. Please send me drafts, right? I think the last time I'm going to be able to read drafts of SA1 will probably be the day that you turn in your uh, fiction exam, which would be Wednesday, September 23rd. So if you want to get a draft, you basically have three weeks to do so from the day. I would definitely suggest you do that um, because together, like I said, SA1 and exam one are worth 14% of your grade or 14 points of your overall grade. So it could be a difference between 100 and an 84 come the first week of October, right? Uh, especially if you don't do so well leading up to that point, which I hope everybody does do well leading into the first fiction exam and first fiction paper. Otherwise, I'm going to cut it short. I'm going to leave it there. Again, you can email me. Uh, I will send out another invite for our talk about the, the Marvel short story next Wednesday. So you'll probably get that sometime on Tuesday. If you get 10, great. If not, you will have a video. Um, have a good week. Enjoy Labor Day, and I will see everybody during week three.